Recorded live at Tox and Tasting Studios, it's the Clerical Errors Podcast. The podcast that shows you what's behind the collar. Let's go. From the Tox and Tasting Studio, I'm Bulligan. I'm Berg. And I'm Vicker. Welcome to the Clerical Errors Podcast, the show that shows you what's behind the collar. How are you doing, Pete? Oh, not too bad. How about yourself? All right. Um, feeling energized, maybe? I'm on fewer uh, antihistamines today, so so hopefully that'll bode well for the show. Indeed. Feel a lot better than I did last episode. <laughs> it was such a long time ago. <laughs> um, how, how are you doing, Berg? Uh, you know, it's going steady by jerks, as they say. You know what's, what's interesting when we do two two podcasts in a row? Yeah. Is uh, like our opening, we're kind of all opened out already. Even though it's a new episode, we're like... Yeah, it's kind of like how I write my sermons. There's not much of an introduction. It's just, let's get right into this, right? Yeah, and usually a vicar will try to write an introduction, and usually, you know. Although I do have <laughs> I do have a drink that I want to try sometime. What's, what's that? So I was reading a book this morning, uh, a novel, and they were talking about buttered rum. And it's supposed to be uh, a, a drink in the wintertime, uh, fall, you know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it sounded really good. So uh, before I went to school today, I uh, I was looking up recipes for this buttered rum, and I'm like, oh, this could be kind of fun. Oh, that maybe we'll have to do that in the show, and you and Vicar can have some. Is that, yeah. Is that supposed to be comparable to a hot toddy? See, I'm not 100% sure. Um, I guess there are a lot of different ways you can make it. It really became popular again in the 1940s. So, but I I want to use the real butter, you know, the spices, all that kind of stuff. There are two different ways you can make it. You can make it with like all the spices, then you can just make it. I think with the rum and the the hot water or butter or whatever. So, sounds good. I'm curious now. So you know, mm-hmm. there was another early Americana drink that I tried once. Um, it was they had it during the Revolutionary times, and they would actually use like a hot poker to heat it up. Uh, I don't know if I just didn't make it right, but it it wasn't the best thing in the world. But I mean, it was kind of a fun thing to. Well, one to thing try. that you and Vicar Vicar, do you like scotch? I do. Did we talk about that on the no, show? No, we yet? didn't. Vicar, you're a good guy. Well, it comes by him naturally, though. I am Scottish. That's good. Are you uh, a Highland Scot? I don't know that much about him. Um, the the background you're saying of yeah, being where, where you're from. Yeah, I'm not that familiar with the geography yet of Scotland. See, so. how do you know what tartan to buy? Well, I know the clan. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah, it's Macaulay. And okay. They, they have a kind of a red, green, yellow tartan for normal use, and then they have a hunting tartan, and that's more greens. And so I like the fact that they have a hunting tartan. So you know I'm expecting you now to wear a kilt. Those days are gone. Come on now. <laughs> Come on. Show hey. Be proud of your heritage. Hey, you know what? That's what leg day's for, Vicar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, oh, well, you guys are going to go to the gym again, so that'll be that'll be good. <laughs> some squats, some lunges, some deadlifts, get some glute activation. I mean, Sounds just think good. how much more free you'll feel, like, when you're hunting, you know, if you were wearing a kilt. Not always a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> See, my problem is I'm allergic to wool. So, oh yeah, that's no good. So, getting back to Scotch, <laughs> favorite region? I don't have the that information yet. Highlands, Lowlands, Speyside. I'm I'm going to to experiment with things from the store across the street from our house. Um, every time I go in, I'm trying to buy a new a new kind. So, have so, you bought like Glenlivet? Is that kind of where you're at right now? Um, not quite, but I'm open to suggestions. All right. So well, give him a little. See. So well, we we will get. We'll do this upright next time we record. I'll bring. Okay. So give give Glenn a give a like a little like a like a progression like how you like where do you start and how you know. Yeah. So I mean, a lot of the go to ones are like Glen Levitt. Okay. They're Johnny Walker. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I I don't I don't particularly prefer those, and I think they're not a very good place to start people because they, I think they're harsher than they need to be. Uh, I am more of a fan of starting people on uh, a space side scotch called Glen Farkless because it is very, very smooth and it has a lot of the uh, apple, kind of like the almost the roasted candy apple 
flavored uh, flavors to it. Um, Island Park is also good. That's getting a little bit more of your peat in it. Your islands are going to have a little more of your sea salt kind of taste. Your highlands are going to be more floral. And uh, and then you have uh, Isla. And Isla is going to be your very peaty, smoky, um, amazingness. I think so. I do appreciate that smoky right. flavor to it. Okay, well, yes. we'll get this done. Next time we record, I'll... Because you've, you've actually toured most of these places, right? Yeah, yeah. I've been to their distilleries and, you know... It was it was great. That was three four years ago now. Yeah, before I was married. Right. So. That's what. Yeah. That's the kind of the kind of thing that when you're single, you can do stuff like that. Right. You can be gone for two weeks and it's not a big deal. <laughs> so, but actually, it's kind of funny because now one of the uh, one of my buddies that went on the trip with me, he's also getting married. The pastor in this district. Oh. Dodgers. Okay. Yeah, he's getting married in October. So. Oh, good for him. Yeah. So thanks be to God. So uh, what are you preaching on, Vicar? What's the the text for this Sunday? Trinity fifteen, correct? Yes, and that's Matthew chapter six, twenty four through thirty four. Can you kind of give us a little bit of a rundown of what that is? It's the do not worry text. Do 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 do. Should I read it, or would you like me just to talk about it a little bit? Uh, I, I like the fine art of paraphrasing. Okay, so don't worry about things in your life, uh, food, clothes. Um, Jesus is saying, look at how I even take care of the, the sparrows, you know, things in nature. So why should you worry? Um, the, the Father feeds them. But instead, seek the kingdom and his righteousness. So, uh, Berg, do you know what you're preaching on that, for that yet? Uh, not really, but I've got I've got some interesting ideas here. Um, it's amazing here how Jesus uses a, a logical argument in order to comfort people. Mm-hmm. He makes an argument from the lesser to the greater. Uh, this is why he uses things like uh, the birds, and he uses the flowers. Uh, he uses these in order to uh, comfort us and say, hey, look, birds, they're not that important. Right, and he does this in other places in Scripture too. He's like, "Aren't two sparrows sold for a penny?" Mm-hmm. Right? Birds aren't that important. They don't do all of the stuff that we do, and yet God still feeds them. But right? they can fly, though. They can, <laughs> they can fly to other parts, right? <laughs> oh, we could migrate too if we wanted. There you go. But that's the thing, right? So if God does this for the birds, you know, this is the lesser, and then the greater implication is: is how much more is He going to feed you? God clothes the flowers, and he makes them more beautiful than even Solomon, who is the richest king of the Old Testament, right? We had uh, we talked about that a, you know, a number of shows ago, 666 talents of gold a year, and I think he could buy how many uh, Air Force Ones? It was like yeah. 17 or 18 of them mm-hmm. every year. Uh, and yet Solomon, for all of his wealth and for everything that he had— um, he is not as beautiful as these flowers, which are here, and then we chuck them in the oven, you know, to burn them the next day. And anybody who's been on an altar guild and deals with the flowers, you know, we right we know that that's the truth, right? They wilt right away, and right, and they lose and they, their luster. Yeah, because I always wondered, you know, the, the purpose of buying flowers here. Watch these die. Yeah, it's uh, definitely a memento mori. Right. Why don't right? you do like with cats? You just give someone a cat head. So it's interesting here. I don't know how to respond to that. So I'm just going to keep going. So um, so here we see this sort of argument from the lesser to the greater in order to comfort, to comfort those people uh, who are stressed out by all of the work and all of the toil of life. Now, what this, and we're going to get into this a little bit later and talk about casistry like we threatened to last mm-hmm. time, right? Um, this is... <laughs> This sort of comfort is not an absolute statement, right? Because right. Jesus is not saying you'll always get what you want. Right. You always have food in your tummy. Or, or or be or be like the sparrows and don't, you know, farm your land and put it in the grain bin and don't right. have anything in your pantry. That is not what Jesus is saying here. But he is saying, in a sense, though, that a lot of our worries are self imposed. Right. That that is the point that he is uh that he is focusing on here. 
he is attacking this sort of, um, you know, because we as Americans love the idea of being independent. But independent, making ourselves independent uh, is a, is very exhausting. And it makes you worry. Because if you don't make it, nobody's going to take care of you. Right? Mm-hmm. And that's where a lot of the anxiety comes from is that, hey, if I've got to do this, then I'm not going to have, and I, and I fail. Uh, nobody's going to help me. No one's going to take care of me if I have to pull myself up by my bootstraps. And this is why there is so much anxiety in the world. Because when you become your own God, that is a tiring and exhausting and very anxious job. Yeah. Um, and And if you're not satisfied with what God gives you, that's going to cause worry as well. Yeah. I mean, you think about it. Uh, I was listening to Jordan Peterson the other day, you know, you know how you get on YouTube and you just start like clicking on stuff. Right. And I think he was giving a Ted talk on this and it was great because he said, if you're making $30,000 a year, you're already in the one in the top 1% of the world's population. Wow. Okay. Do you know what that means, Vicar? You're average? <laughs> I don't know if I'm there yet. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and what he's doing is, is he's, put, he's putting it in perspective for us that uh, compared to any other time in human history, we have more comfort than the richest kings of Europe or the richest kings anywhere. I mean, which of them had uh, the sort of, you know, hot running water, indoor plumbing, mm-hmm. and, you know, the sort of selection of food that we can order online and have delivered to our door, right? I mean, mm-hmm. that that is fantastic that we can get almost anything we could possibly want, right? We eat meat every day. Like, that is that is huge. That yeah. is that is such a huge uh, thing. And the fact that we are more concerned with not with what we eat, but eating too much. Right. That, that we're all fat, you know, <laughs> because because we have such an abundance of food that people are voluntarily fasting. Like, this is what that whole mm-hmm. intermittent fasting thing is, is like our bodies are wired in such a way that we, we, well, that's why we you, never ate every day, you know? Right. That's why, you know, you look at some art and, and the, the standard of beauty of women were rounder women because that was a sign of that they were getting plenty of food. Right. And even the poorest among us um, have access to so much. It, it's really, we live in an amazing time. We live in such a surfeit of abundance uh, compared to the rest of the world. And we are some of the most anxious people on the planet. And it is, it is so... Self-imposed. Sad, right? It is so sad. Vicar, you actually have a, you had said something about this not too long ago. You, you mentioned, if, if you don't mind, if you can take this out if you don't want, if you want to talk about it, but you mentioned that uh, um, when you were making out your budget and how this is, you've never been so happy. Yes, uh, we were talking about, I think you're referring to vet, vet bills, right? Or uh, as a seminarian or... No, I think you were, you were looking at your like your oh, family yeah. budget like three years ago or something. Right, right. My wife and I looked back and a few years ago when we were um, earning two incomes and, and we had more debt though and more problems and less to, to live off of at the end of the day. But now we look at such a more simplified budget and we're, we're happier, but we're definitely making less. Um, yeah, a lot less than I'm sure you were making. But before. happier is the underlying. Right. And I think people are starting to realize this, that um, training and discipline is a good thing. A sort of this voluntary lessening of, of the things that we have. And mm-hmm. the Finnish know this too. Uh, there was a great podcast on Art of Manliness called Sisu, which is a Finnish word meaning like kind of rugged self-reliance and that sort of thing. And so what they do is they actually go out to their cabins out in the middle of nowhere, and it's just four walls and a roof, you know, very rude um, surroundings. Mm -hmm. And yet because of this, and, and they actually, like, they do this gladly. They actually deprive themselves of the modern amenities and comforts of life, and uh, that's why they're some of the happiest people on earth. 
This sounds like the spiritual walk of deer camp every year. Okay. By the way, do you know what that sounds like to ADHD? What's that? Of like a small room, four walls, out in the middle of nowhere. You just described... Hell? Yes. <laughs> See, I think you would really like it. Because you'd be chopping wood, you'd be hiking through the woods, because this is all in the summertime. Okay. Finding water. Finding water, carrying water. I think you would I think you would thrive off of something like this. It'd be like going to your weightlifting program mm-hmm. without by just living. Yeah, maybe. But yeah, talk about this uh deer camp thing. Well, I guess my friends and I do a softer version of that because we usually rent a cabin or a place at a uh, like a condo almost, but it's a, at a rustic resort. Um, but the traditional, if you watch, say, in northern Michigan or northern Wisconsin, it's it's a shack in the woods, mm-hmm. and my, my brother-in-law owns one of these in the UP. There's usually no power, maybe some propane, wood stove, maybe a sauna, but you're living off the bare basics. Right. You have cards and you have beer. Yep. And that's really all you need. Right. No, it, I don't know. There's something that sounds very refreshing about that. See, I could see that for me, if it was like a, like a deserted island on a beach. Okay. So we're just quibbling about location. There you go. There we yeah. go. So, yeah. That, that would be more me. So you'd be finding coconuts and, uh, and talking to Wilson. Right. Right. And not wearing a shirt. Well, we knew we knew that. I mean, you know, that was just kind of a given. But is that which is actually tie back to the text because when you go down like to a beach resort area, what's one of the big themes that they have? No worries, right? Yeah. Well, and it's interesting too, right? Because all of these secular people are seeing that there's an issue, right? That people despite having all this stuff, are really, really unhappy. And so they're voluntarily fasting. They're voluntarily uh, giving stuff up. You have the minimalist movement Mm -hmm. where people are decluttering their homes, Mm -hmm. right, and getting rid of stuff. Uh, And they're on the right track because they recognize that there's a problem. But they don't recognize that the, the problem is primarily spiritual, Right. That the problem actually has to do with... Uh, it's kind of like the whole tiny house movement. Right. Uh, you know, so there are, you know, there are these movements out there, right? And they're dealing with people's anxieties and stuff, but they're not actually dealing with the core root problem. I haven't got my business model off the ground yet, by the way. Do you know what it is? Do you know how the, this whole tiny house thing, right? Of marketing uh, tiny mansions. So the house itself will be the same size as a normal house. But inside, it's a mansion, like 10 bedrooms, a home theater, uh, the, the whole thing. It's, just a, it's a tiny, but it's a mansion. You build it inside an existing house. It's a tiny house, but it's a mansion. Mm-hmm. Are you getting... getting, getting are yeah, you... there was a, a parishioner at the church we were at prior to this in, in Fort Wayne that showed us, you wouldn't know this from looking outside, but they had a basketball court below their house. They had a bi-level house, and the little windows you know, see that are usually for the basement, those are actually at the top of a high ceiling of a basketball court. And it's purposely looking like that from the outside, so you don't know it's there. But it, it was neat to find. Huh? Yeah. Wow. I mean, I never would... Yeah. Isn't it amazing? Like, I don't know. And that's the thing is like, you know, and people do this. I think it's just, it's sad what people do to themselves. You know, our... We have way more than people in the 1950s had. You know, I think the average uh, house in the 1950s was like, was less than a thousand square feet. And now I think the average house for us is like 2,300 square feet. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I was listening to another podcast on that. I mean, so, I mean, our homes have doubled, but it's like our expectations have just really gone out of whack. Right. You know, I, I noticed that in, in from a generation standpoint that that, uh, you know, building a new household, you know, the older generation, it took a while before you had a bigger house or you had the ability to to furnish it. And it seems like people want all of that right away. Yeah. 
And I think the older generation doesn't do the younger generation any favors but because they don't want them to go through what they went through. And it's like, you know, maybe that's not such a bad thing. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe it's not such a bad thing to, uh, you know, have a few physical difficulties. Because I think that's part of the issue, too, is most of us aren't concerned with starving to death, right, mm-hmm. in this country. I mean, Or having having nothing to wear. Or having nothing to wear. Or, you know, losing our homes or, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. I mean, there are some people I'm sure who who do face those kind of things. Right. But even then, there are things like food banks and and the like. Right. Um, so where does all of that outwardness go? It goes inward. Right. And so we run all these things through our head and we go crazy. I mm-hmm. think that's part of it. So. Right. But the answer in the text: seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What I like about that part is he doesn't say worry about that either. Right. Because it'll be it's given to you. Right. I found it interesting this the pericope about do not worry starts at verse 25, but but the lectionary lectionary throws in verse 24 before that which is no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. But everything we've been talking about kind of took that into consideration already. Right. That, uh, yeah, and I mean, I think that's what we're going to see too is, you know, people are very worried and anxious about things like inflation, right? I mean, that's Mm -hmm. kind of the big topics nowadays. Mm -hmm. Then who are they serving, God or money? Exactly. That uh, we end up serving money a lot of times when, when we think we're... And this is the scariest part, right? You know, we people do all these things because they think they're doing the right thing. They think that by working these long hours and by worrying about this stuff and by serving money, they're actually serving God, their family, whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Their own ambitions. And money's a cruel God. Right. You know, you can't ever get that time back with your kids, for example. You know, and um, and uh, you know, you serve money. It's a never ending because you you ever feel like you have enough, right? It's like uh, well, I think it was Carnegie who said this, right? How much is enough? When he was asked how much is enough, and he said a little bit more than what you got. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is, and this is the great temptation, right? Um, and that we try to fill our lives with these things and. Ultimately, uh, they end up crowding out God, and they themselves are nothing in the end anyway, because it's all going to burn on the last day. Who will care what kind of boat you have, or if you had a tiny mansion? (laughs) Right? Yeah. It's going to happen. That's going to start, at some point, there's going to be someone who will start selling those and be well known, and I will think, I missed my opportunity. I think you should just start now. Well, I think you and uh, Pastor Rieger should get into it. Because he's kind of the carpenter. Yes, I, I have no skills that arena. And, you know, you could be like the face, right? The marketing. Yes. I can be like from pastor to CEO. There we go. <laughs> what are the odds? <laughs> All right, so we have something we would like to talk about. Berg is fired up about. And um, it is on the topic of casuistry. Now, the listener may not be aware of what that word means. Vicar, do you know what that word means? I have a feeling, but I think you should fill me in for clarity. Well, that's, you're the Vicar app, though. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, Berg, help us out. All right. So casuistry is the process of reasoning that seeks to resolve moral problems by extracting or extending theoretical rules from a particular case and reapplying those rules to new instances. This method occurs in applied ethics and jurisprudence. The term is also commonly used as a pejorative to criticize the use of clever or but unsound reasoning, especially in relation to moral questions. Okay. Okay, so it's a type of reasoning that takes rules, right, general mm-hmm. rules, 
and then applies them in very concrete circumstances. Okay? All right. So, for example, um, if a murder occurs, right? Mm -hmm. Right? We know that the Fifth Commandment forbids murder, and most state laws forbid murder. You know, thou sh you, know you shouldn't murder. Uh, but are the laws the same for every instance of murder? No. 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 Why? Sometimes it seems justified. Okay. Sometimes, like, there's the self-defense, Cast right? Mm -hmm. Castle laws. Is Castle laws. Thinking. You have, uh, like, an accidental killing, which so they label it... Uh, and label it uh, sounds horrible, like manslaughter. Right, involuntary manslaughter. Right. Right? There are some, like, second-degree murder is done uh, when a person is passionate, but it's not premeditated, which is then uh, uh, distinguished from first-degree murder, which is premeditated murder, mm -hmm. where you actually plan it and think about it. So even the law is applied differently in all of these different cases, which is why we have things like juries and judges. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, so that's the thing. Casistry is the way of applying, you know, thou shalt not murder to all of these particular cases. We do the same thing in pastoral care, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we don't just uh, go to the bedside of somebody and just say, well, Jesus saves. Right. See you later. But what do we do? We go to the pastoral companion and turn to the right page. <laughs> <laughs> but even there, but even there, right? Even there, uh, there are particular instances. Instances, right? Correct. Things like spiritual affliction, loneliness, anger. Um, if someone is chronically ill, if someone uh, is a child, if someone is an elderly adult, um, mm -hmm. and we actually take the. You know, our, the command that we have been given, that is to preach the law and the gospel to our, our people and to educate both old and young, and then we apply it in particular situations, and that's going to look different depending on the person mm -hmm. and the state of mind that they're in and um, you know what sort of sins they're particularly dealing with. Right. How much time they, like if they're dying today or in three weeks. Right. So um, this is something that we do all the time, not just pastors, but... Uh, doctors. But doctors do this. Lawyers do this. This is why they look for things like precedent, right? right? I think that, that this is a, the, 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 I think a good example that we, we're dealing right now is, is the vaccination debate, and not to tread on that, but one group says everyone, another group says no one, and there's like seems like there's no middle ground, right? Yeah, or even debates about things like government overreach. You've got Romans thirteen people who say, "Well, you just have to obey the government in everything," mm -hmm. and then you have other people who say, "America not going <laughs> to obey anybody," right? Right. And that sort of absolutist thinking. Uh, is very, very naive. It's very myopic, and they don't even believe it. So, for example, like if you were to extend that out, right? If a mom and dad started torturing their children, are the children just going to say, well, mom and dad are going to torture us, and we're so we're going to honor it? Right, no. No that, no, that would be insane. No one would counsel their child to do that. Right? So that's the thing, is that there is no absolute command to obey the government in everything, right? The government actually does have limits. There are limits to what their, their authority can extend over, right? Mm -hmm. We see this in, uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, right? With, uh, um, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, render to God what is God's. Well, what does that, by implication, tell us? That, that Caesar, the, Caesar gets his authority from God, but the ultimate authority is God. Right. And there are some things that belong to Caesar. And there are other things. Therefore, there are other things that don't belong to Caesar, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's the thing, is that this sort of absolutist thinking, um, and this is the kind of stuff that happened, you know, in during the Vietnam War, too, right? Mm -hmm. Where people who were against the war in Vietnam— 
then turned their ire against the soldiers who were returning. Right? Mm -hmm. And I don't think any of us would say that that was actually a good thing. Right? That you, you can actually be opposed to a conflict while still loving and supporting the troops who were there. Right. Right? Um, but you see, this is the sort of stuff that absolutist thinking gets us, right? When we don't actually use casistry in a good way, in a way that applies general rules or axioms to concrete situations. So some biblical examples. Um, uh, the Pharisees and Jesus always argued about this kind of thing. If Jesus healed on the Sabbath, for example, mm-hmm. that, that broke in their mind the hard and fast rule. You know, you don't do anything on the Sabbath. Right. You don't work on the Sabbath. Right. And healing someone... Is work. Is work. And so Jesus was always challenging those absolutist type of thinking with with the gospel. Yeah, and once again there, he uses an argument from the lesser to the greater, right? He's like, which one of you, if you had a donkey or an ox fall into a pit, that you wouldn't immediately drag him out? Right. Another example would be when Peter asked... Jesus, how many times must I forgive my brother? Mm -hmm. What was he looking for? An absolutist? Give me a number. Right. And and, and Jesus didn't give him a number. Well, he gave him a number to insinuate there wasn't a number. Right. (laughs) Exactly. So so Jesus does that all the time as well, where um, where he he used people's various situations. Like if he if speaking to a widow. He would definitely alter it how he spoke to the Pharisees. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Jesus doesn't just go around preaching the same message everywhere. That's why but, he told parables. Right. I mean, so that's the thing. It's like, okay, guys, like we actually do tailor our message. And this is why it's very important for pastors to write their sermons every week, right? So that way these sermons can be tailor made for the specific congregation. That's why vicarage, the sermons get a little easier to write is because you, you get to know the congregation. You get to know what people are going through a little bit more. And so, um, you know, the first sermons tend to be general, genuine, gen, general, just kind of law gospel, mm-hmm. which is good. But then they, they kind of, as they get to know the people and talk with people, it really changes. Well, how, what kind of law do they need to hear? Right. How does the gospel apply to what they're going through? Which is hard to do when you're just starting out. Starting yeah. out, um, it gives you a chance to get a little, to gain a little bit of a nuance, because and that's what what makes preaching easier when you're preaching every Sunday, is the fact that okay, you know, the sermon's going to be different because the people are different. I as a pastor might be in a different place too. Mm-hmm. Well, and you know, I was just thinking about this too. Doctors do this all the time. Right? Doctors do this all the time. Uh, with, um, you know, they have general rules too of how the human body should work. Mm-hmm. Right? And they apply those general rules in very specific cases when they have you come in. Right? That's why, like, all of your, your maladies, right? With your esophagus and stuff, I mean, the way that they're treating you uh, is based on all of these other precedents of them treating other people. Mm-hmm. You know? And it's really, uh, so yeah, this is stuff that is going on all the time, right? Um, right. And uh, it is because at the same time, it doesn't fall into some sort of moral relativism. Right. Right? There's Where, still some hard, like the Ten Commandments, for example. Right. You know, that this isn't a way to, you know, just say, well, it doesn't really mean anything. No, I mean, that's not true at all. The casuistry you're talking about is an attempt to be uh, cl- as close to the Word of God and answering these things as we can. Right, and to apply it to a specific context, a very concrete context. It's like um, Pythagoras' theorem, right? Oh, Vicar's favorite. My right? favorite math. A-, <laughs> a-, a squared plus B squared <laughs> equals C squared, right? That would be the general axiom. But to take that and then to use it as you're building like a frame or a house— Right? Mm-hmm. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about taking these these very um general ideas, right? And then 
and then applying them in very concrete ways, right?、Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not some sort of relativistic. Well, you know, I'm going to say whatever I can say to you know make people happy, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, 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 are there some? Then, do you have some like a process that that kind of can help us, a Christian, go through these things? Yeah.、Uh, and uh, this, I found this、uh, on the Lutheran Orthodoxy blogspot page. This is the blog uh, of uh, Doctor、uh, Benjamin Mays.、Uh, he actually did his PhD work on Lutheran casuistry. Okay. And actually translated a whole bunch of.、Uh, Casuistry questions and stuff from、uh, the Lutheran fathers, because this was a big thing for them. So here I'll、uh, here's kind of his introduction here. LCMS Winkle casuistry sessions often suffer from amnesia, and here he's talking about the meetings that pastors have. And we've talked about this before. How when pastors get together, we usually do a text study, we usually do a dogmatic study, and then we at the end deal with casuistry questions. Right. You know, because we're dealing with particular pastoral questions and how to help particular people, and he says that we often suffer from amnesia, like because we don't know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, in order to draw on the wisdom of the past as well as、uh, of your contemporaries, consider these guidelines when you are confronted by cases of conscience. Okay, so people have problems. Okay, they've got moral problems. How do we deal with this? Where do we start? So first, list the commandments and other biblical precepts that could have a bearing on the question. So this would be like the Ten Commandments,、mm-hmm. okay? And these are the ones we should always go to first because they are God's immutable law. They、right. are valid in all times and in all places, okay?、Uh, old、uh, other biblical precepts. These are the moral law. Not the Old Testament ceremonial or civil law, so like, what would、um, an instance of like、uh, the Old Testament ceremonial law be? Eating pork. Yeah, eating、sure. pork. Right, doesn't apply anymore. Right,、mm-hmm. it was a law specifically for the for the people of Israel in order to foreshadow that the Messiah was going to come from them. So you can't use things like eating pork or kosher laws. In order to determine these questions, okay, or Old Testament civil law, so all the stuff about kings doesn't mean that then we should have a monarchy who's、mm-hmm. you know, or you know how certain crimes were supposed to be punished. Right? Can you think of some in particular? What the ones that always make the headlines are about from sexuality about people getting stoned and that kind of thing. Is that what you believe they throw in your face?、Mm-hmm. Right, and that is a mixture, right, of the moral law and the civil law,、mm-hmm. isn't it?、Mm-hmm. Because sexual sins belong to the sixth commandment. However, the punishment of said sins, that they are crimes,、uh, belong to the civil law, right?、Mm-hmm. And even though we、uh, we don't have the one, right? We don't stone people or. Uh, burn the daughters of priests who have become prostitutes and that sort of stuff, right?、Mm-hmm. Because those were Old Testament punishments、uh, for those particular crimes, right? Just because something is a sin doesn't necessarily mean that it's a crime, right?、Mm-hmm. Does everyone understand、yep. that distinction? Yeah, right.、Yep. Like things like murder are are not only sins but crimes. Blasphemy used to be both a sin and a crime, right? But、mm-hmm. now it's no longer a crime. And all you have to do is listen to the radio, right? For that or the TV, <laughs> right? <laughs>、um, so, so that's so that's a good distinction to make. All right. So first, you have the Ten Commandments. Second, you have other biblical precepts that belong to the moral law. Third would be your biblical examples from the narrative that have God's judgment expressed with them, right? So you're kind of moving down, right? And these are. How important they are! Of course, the Ten Commandments always come first, then the other biblical precepts, and then the narratives. And then the narratives then start to provide some of the casuistry because some of them apply to certain circumstances that may not apply to other circumstances. Right. So,、um, yeah, can you think of any? Um.、Uh, how about?、Uh, Saint Paul talking about food dedicated to other gods. Okay, 
where he says it's you know it's okay to eat, but if it's causing your your brother to stumble, then don't eat it. Right, right. Another one. I was reading the Book of Concord on repentance, um, the apology, and Melanchthon makes a very good point here that I think really fits in well. He says, you know, this is what basically the Roman Catholics of his day were doing. They said, okay, King David sinned with Bathsheba. Nathan confronted David and then gave him a punishment, right? That the sword will never depart from his house and that, um, you know, his child would die. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it is necessary for priests to give canonical satisfactions to you, punishments for your sins, okay? Mm -hmm. So that was their argumentation, okay? And Melanchthon says, well, no, the narrative only goes so far in that uh, David gets this particular punishment, right? That doesn't mean that everyone who sins... Gets the same punishment. ...gets that sort of punishment, okay? That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, yep. good. So this is why they go down in order, right? Uh, then, necessary deductions from biblical principles, right? You actually have to deduce things, because people will make this these sort of stupid statements all the time. Well, where in the Bible does it say that? And then I and then I come back with, well, where in the Bible does it say that you're saved? <laughs> Seriously, does it say that Carl Bolhagen is saved in the Bible? No. Then why do you believe it? The Bible doesn't say it. I've deduced it. You've deduced it, right? Ah, isn't it beautiful? Right. <laughs> That's the thing. Is like, <laughs> like this isn't that hard, right? We do this all the time. It's just people really are lazy. And they don't want to think about it. Mm -hmm. And so their cop-out is, is, well, you know, the Bible doesn't actually say it. Well, yeah, the Bible doesn't say a lot of things. But you actually are deducing it from this, right? Mm -hmm. So that that is the next thing, right? And then finally, natural law, right? There is such a thing as natural law. Things like self-preservation, right, is a natural law. Um, property is a natural law. Getting concussions in football, something we addressed last time. Right. You know, that's where you start. And then next, it's, if necessary, research the state of the question. For example, if it is a question that touches on law or medicine, you should consult experts in these areas. So if you are dealing with something, like you mentioned before, a vaccine, you should actually... Talk to your doctor. Right. Or read up on it or, you know, get out your medical mm -hmm. books and that sort of stuff, right? You actually need to know... Um, what is going on? One one way that, as a pastor, we might deal with this is, is uh, you know, we're not trained in a lot of meta mental health issues, mm -hmm. and there can be a lot of crossover with faith issues and mental illness issues. Right. So if you're dealing with someone with certain mental health issues, you might want to kind of bone up and talk to someone who is an expert on those things to help you kind of ferret out how much is this, of this is really a faith issue that they're struggling with and how much is of it is, you know, some sort of a, a mental health problem. Or if it's an issue with uh, jurisprudence, right, with the law, you might actually have to research what that law says, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that's the thing is we should know these things. Uh, and on a more personal basis, if you're dealing with... Um, a parishioner, right? Um, you need to kind of know, you know, and if it has to do with like their calling, right? Or with their occupation, mm -hmm. you might need to know how their occupation actually works, works. Yeah. right? I mean, it's just like being a doctor. You actually have to know like their medical history and some of that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So, which, which is why there's value in pastors, for example, just visiting for visiting's sake. Right. And this is why, too, if any of uh, you know the layman listening here, you know, it's really, really helpful not to ask your pastor general questions. Because we know you have something in mind, mm -hmm. and it is really, really helpful <laughs> if you give us that background, mm -hmm. because uh, it's going to be a lot easier to answer your question, and it's going to hopefully be more satisfying to you. Right. Because we, we wind up trying to get to the heart of the issue you know or our answer is going to be so general 
that it's not really going to satisfy anybody. Right. So that's why it's very, very important to, you know, when you're, when you're actually asking for advice on particular things, you need to talk to your pastor, like in a very, and it might even feel invasive because mm-hmm. you got to tell them stuff that maybe you don't want to tell, to tell. Right. And by the way, there is an episode where you can uh, teach us how maybe you can approach your pastor. Right. A couple episodes ago. But if he doesn't know that, if he doesn't know that, you know, it's kind of like your doctor, right? If he doesn't know you have a boil on your butt that, you know, flares up every two years or whatever, Mm -hmm. I mean, he can't help you, right? He can't help you the way that you really need to be helped. Right. Kind of of like, uh, you know, sometimes... Uh, elderly will try to keep things from their doctor just so that they don't have to have deal with whatever the doctor is going to tell them to do. Right. I mean, you know, because that's the thing. We all know the general answer, right? Mm -hmm. To be healthy, you need to... Eat well, exercise. And exercise, right? Sleep. Sleep, right? Like, that's pretty, pretty general. But what that exercise looks like for a guy who's 500 pounds... Right mm-hmm. or a guy who has high blood pressure, um, or whatever. I mean, that's going to be different, mm-hmm. you know. Um, what eating well looks like for the guy with five hundred pounds, uh, or a guy like Vicar, it's going to be very different, right? Because Vicar is pretty thin, so trying to be. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, and this are is... you saying he needs a dirty bulk? Is that <laughs> that is exactly what I'm saying. I need that's what vicarage is that. vicarage is the dirty ball so <laughs> that's right <laughs> so okay so when you're researching the state of the question right it has to do with medicine you need to look up medicine if you're looking at the law you're gonna have to look up the law right and so this is why sometimes these questions uh you know if you really want to know it's going to take some work right you're not going to be able to come up with snap judgments right away Right, mm-hmm. um, especially if it's a complex question, right? Um, and so, being patient, dirty bulking with God's word, you know, doing doing some of the hard research, you know, that's how you get really good feedback. Right, right. You can actually answer these questions in the way that they can be answered. Third, research the wisdom of the past. Right. This is important because other... Knowing history. Yeah, knowing history, knowing how other people have dealt with this uh, is very important. And, for and past, some of that, that, that can be a little regional, too. Yeah, I mean, there's advice that Luther gives... That, yeah. ...that I wouldn't give, because <laughs> I, I don't think it's necessarily right. But, <laughs> but you know, um, there's some that, uh, for him, that I would give. Right. Some of his marital advice every once in a while is kind of... Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. But once again, I'm not going to... You know, it, that's what makes it hard sometimes. But anyway, you know, that's why, like, uh, you know, when he tells a depressed guy, um, go hang out with your friends and drink a beer when he's depressed, right? Mm. Don't be alone. I might not, you know, necessarily uh, um, encourage him to drink a beer, knowing how depression works, mm-hmm. right? But I would encourage him to go out and, you know, find people, right? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there's a lot of good stuff like Martin Luther's Letters of Spiritual Counsel that uh, I think is still required reading for um, a pastoral theology class, right? It wasn't required, but it was suggested, and um, I have a copy that I'm working on reading. Yeah, it is just, it's beautiful stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean... One, one thing I find interesting about it is is uh, how, how tough he is for people who are actually... So he's kind... But then he has a little bit of a get over yourself. <laughs> well, and once again, right? Right. If these are people who are dealing with the same problem over and over again, you know, sometimes Luther gives them a little bit of tough love mm-hmm. and says, hey, you know, what you're actually doing is uh, belittling God. Right. It's, it's kind of like if someone's going through a tough time, you know, and he's they're kind of moaning. It's like, what do you think our sins deserve? You know? <laughs> right. Or... Uh, or, you know, Staupitz acted that way with, with Luther because he kept going back to the confessional booth again and again. And he's like, look, dude, believe that Jesus actually died for you, <laughs> right? Go out and make some real sins, right? And 
of course he didn't mean actually go right. you know but uh so but that's the thing it's um these these uh, voices from the past can be very very helpful for us which is why like on things with covid-19 uh you see a lot of posts uh from luther's um treatise on you know what should a christian do during a plague mm-hmm. you know so that that made its round on the, in you know on the interwebs right so four discuss your finding with peers hear their counsel and evaluate it it's always good to check your stuff with other people mm-hmm. because and other people who may not tell you what you want to hear right right because i think especially in this day and age you know we all like our echo chambers far too much right uh you need to have people that you respect who are going to give it to you straight who are going to tell you if you're wrong Mm -hmm. or challenge you and that's a very important thing and sometimes it's also good to have someone hear the evidence who is not so entangled in it Right, because you, you, you can be so emotionally involved and have so much baggage that you're not actually seeing the clear truths that are coming out of the situation. Right. I mean, this is why um, you know Isaiah says about our Lord. You know, he shall not he shall not judge with his eyes. Mm-hmm. Right. That uh, justice is blind in that way. Right. It doesn't look on whether a man is rich or poor. You know, but it judges these things on its own merits. And sometimes when you're so close to people, uh, you make faulty judgments, right? Mm-hmm. And um, so that's something to keep in mind. It's kind of like, uh, Peter, are you with us? Yeah, yeah. It's oh, kind of like, uh, a little bit, it's kind of like my say it out loud rule. Yeah, right. Well, what you know, you my could, say, uh, well, yeah, say it out loud rule. Like if, if you like, you think of some of your bad decisions you've made in your life, if you were just uh, like... Say it out loud what you were going to do, then it sounds crazy. Right. So, you know, if someone, you know, had say it out loud, I'm going to stay up till three o'clock and then over drink and then try and drive home. <laughs> you know, think of, you know, various situations that you've done. If you, if I had to just said it out loud what I was planning on doing rather than just you kind of you clarifies things for you a little bit and makes right. you say, what on earth am I thinking about doing right now? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I like that. All right. Number five, make the decision that is least likely to be sinful, that is safest from externally violating God's moral law. So instead of asking how far one might be able to go without violating God's moral law, ask how God's moral law can most safely be honored and kept. Because in most situations, we like to think there's a black and white, right and wrong. But there are certain t- times where there is, from a moral law, there's no moral, right, clear-cut answer to that. Right. So it's better to be safe. And kids do this all the time, right? Mm-hmm. They try to say, well, how far can I really go? You know what I mean? It's like you lay down a rule, mm-hmm. and then they... They try to push it, you know. Which is why works righteousness never works. Right, exactly. Like, how many times, we talked about how many times do I have to forgive? Well, then. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do the bare minimum. So that's why it's just very important to be, to choose the safe route, right? Choose the route of faith that, you know, you love your father in heaven. You're not trying to get away from, <laughs> you're not trying to get away right. with anything, right? But you want to keep his law. Okay, distinguish between what is objectively right and wrong, realizing that people sometimes do right actions for bad purposes, but wrong actions cannot be done for good purposes. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that's the thing, is that some people do what's right for fame, right? Mm -hmm. Or for glory, right? But two, you know, and we know this, right? Two wrongs don't make a right, Mm -hmm. right? Doing bad things... To like keep people in church or or do this or do that, right? It, that that is not good, right? right? It, it, it 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 seeks to affect behavior without ever affecting the heart, right? And and the other thing is is that the ends never justify the means, right? 
if you can become, you know, district president, but you'd have to blackmail our district president, right? You know, <laughs> those ends don't justify no. the means, right? I mean, it's not a good thing. So that's the thing is that just because a goal is set, right, and the goal might seem good, it actually does matter how you got there. Right. So, all right. Number six, record the case, the decision, and the arguments that support the decision, right? Just for your own records, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody else could use it. And then finally, he says, have peace of conscience. Luther says, if such a thoroughly doubtful and rare case occurs, whether in this or other articles and matters which cannot be decided on the basis of any scripture or book, then one should have a good, pious man or two give advice and speak to the matter, and after they have given advice and spoken, one should always also remain with their decision and advice without any wavering or doubt. For even if they do not exactly hit the pinnacle of what is right in such obscure matters, yet such a small mistake does not hurt anything, and it is better finally to have peace and calm with disadvantage and less correctness than continuously to seek the most pointed and strictest correctness, which one will never find anyway with infinite discord and unrest." What I like about, you know, a modern day example is, is with the, the whole COVID the last couple of years, right? Mm-hmm. Does anybody feel like any of us handled that perfectly? Does anybody feel like... Like, for example, the shutdowns, how how church was, you know. How church was. Uh, I mean, look... Uh, when, when, when did we wear masks? When we didn't, didn't we wear masks? Could we have done this sooner or later? And all those things. We all think, yeah... We could have done things better, but we didn't. We were working with what we knew. It wasn't. Yep, we worked with what we knew. We committed to God's care. We asked for forgiveness uh, for these things, and we move on. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, that is ultimately the beauty of the gospel. Right? That the gospel gives the peace of the conscience because Christ has taken away all of our sins. And so, this is a great way, I think, of like wrestling with how do you wrestle with problems right how do you wrestle with um moral dilemmas moral dilemmas temptations um i might i might uh can you uh i'd like to maybe go through this would be a good discussion with elders for example yeah i yeah i can forward that on maybe we can put it on the facebook page something like that okay so uh because i think it's good for us to start thinking this way and you know i think this would be a good thing to uh discuss you know whether you move or not or take a new job Mm -hmm. or not um, you know, right. Um, the yeah. kind of friends you hang out with or what, you know, just all those kind of things, right. That can all fall within this sort of this framework. Uh, right. I think it takes some of the pressure off that it's, it's not, we're not being called to be perfect, but to be faithful. Right. And that after you've, and, and see, and it's all predicated on, you know, you did your due diligence, Right. Mm-hmm. You've tried to be safe. You know, you've tried to take the safest route to mm-hmm. not to violate God's and, law. And, and what's know? interesting is when you look at this whole discussion, in uh, in churches where theologies are, are less to, are less gospel oriented, mm-hmm. what do they do? They all become more black and white issues. For example, no dancing. Right. Um foot loose. You know, all sorts of things where it's like Okay, you know, because we don't have the gospel of the sins being forgiven and being freed from that, uh, we're going to bar all sorts of other things. We're going to set some hard and fast rules mm-hmm. so, uh, that uh, don't allow for any kind of casuistry. Or you make it completely gray and muddled, where, you know, I heard uh, um, from a pastor once, uh, from his own mouth, um, he had a a daughter, and he wasn't Missouri Senate, he wasn't Lutheran at all, but he he had a daughter who suffered from, uh, you know, mental, from mental problems, and she was hearing voices. And uh, he would tell her, well, you know, you know, listen, you know, basically, uh, you know, not pointing her back to the objective nature of the scriptures, but basically to, you know, really it it was like, well, is it God talking to me or not? And Mm -hmm. he didn't give her a very satisfactory answer. And that is just, it's sad, right? Mm-hmm. That, yeah, that's um, happened to 
you know, my own family or or people who um, not to Peter or my, you know, but someone in my extended family <laughs> with schizophrenia. <laughs> Um, I'm not laughing about the schizophrenia, you know, I just, Peter laughs, so <laughs> I laugh too, so awkward, <laughs> but, uh, anyway, but, or, you know, or if, you know, and I think evangelicals, American evangelicals really struggle with this issue, like, oh, well, God, you know, God told me I was going to marry this person when it was just a feeling, right? like, I'd like to marry this person. Or they go into your like the Norwegian uh, little hut, and they'll say, "What does God really want for me?" Mm-hmm. And wrestle with it, just me and God. Where it's just like he's gonna send some sort of an external sign. And the great thing he has, and it's the Bible. Right. We know what God wants. Um, and isn't that beautiful? Like the American evangelical does something very ugly. They make us free in regard to God, right? And mm-hmm. that you have to make a decision for him. But then they bind everything else under this this tyranny. Like, well, you know, if, if you don't make the right decision, God's going to be mad at you. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, th- isn't that just the worst sort of tyranny? Where we Lutherans say, yeah, in regards to God, we are bound. We can't choose him. He chooses us. He makes us alive. And then below us, we're given a tremendous amount of freedom. We can farm or not farm. We can mm-hmm. marry this woman or this woman, right? We can do this and we can do that. Mm-hmm. And that this is all given into our hands by him, right? And it doesn't mean that there's a, you know, I mean, sometimes there's a true and a false, right? Right. I mean, but it might be one of degree, right? Mm-hmm. It might actually just be a multiple choice answer. Right. Right? And that's beautiful. That's awesome. Um, because it is freeing. It is freeing for us. And they're, they're then too. You know, we have more risky decisions that just because it's risky may not be bad because it might have a chance for to for higher good. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. And we forget that there's risk in everything that we do. Right. My The very fact of me driving over here today... It was risky. Why is that? Right? Well, because I could have gotten in a car accident. I could have died, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, everything we do has some sort of risk attached to it, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's, once again, why we throw ourselves on the mercy of God and on his son, Jesus Christ. That's why we can have, like Vicar said, we can have peace of conscience, right? Yep. It's freeing. It's freeing that, you know what? It was uh, God's will that I made it here. <laughs> um, so I, I like this uh, discussion, and maybe we can have some more episodes where we apply this. Yeah, I think I think having like a casistry corner might be kind of a nice, you know. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for listening. Uh, Vicar, where can they get hold of us? They could email us at feedback at clericalerrors.org. Or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash clerical errors podcast or at Twitter at me, bro. At clerical errors P. P for podcast. Okay. All right. Thank you for listening. I'm Bullhagen. I'm Berg. And I'm Vicar. And may your casistry be cautious. Thank you for joining us. This podcast is available on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Questions, thoughts, concerns? You can contact us on Facebook at facebook.com slash clerical errors podcast, on Twitter at clerical errors P for podcast, or email us at feedback at clerical Thanks for listening to Clerical Errors. See you next time.